Hey guys, good morning, happy Sunday. Uh, I come to you with greetings and a big cup of tea. Uh, I hope you guys are all keeping well. Um, I'm here to speak to you about King David. Uh, he is one of my favorite biblical heroes. Um, I was probably first attracted to King David just because he shared my name. Uh, David's a great name, the name of kings. And uh, like I admired uh, who he was and his bravery and the fact he was a, a warrior king who just went out and, and got his hands dirty and did what needed to be done as a leader. Um, yet, as I got older and read more into the story, I realized you know, it's so much more than killing giants with slingshots and, and being underappreciated but able to come forth and overachieve. Um, you're all probably familiar with King David's story. I'll, I'll do a brief overview here. Um, it starts in 1 Samuel. Uh, chapter 16 onwards, uh, the first six, 15 chapters of 1 Samuel is all about the prophet Samuel and who he is and how he comes about, but he's the one who announced David and says, as a boy, and says, you're going to be king one day, and why that came about. Um, but yeah, King David was the youngest and littlest son of a large family of brothers. He was a shepherd boy, as the youngest and littlest and most underappreciated, he, he was sent out to the fields to protect the sheep. Um, and suddenly he was anointed by God's prophet to be the next king of Israel. Despite him not having the stature or looks viewed necessary, uh, but he was chosen because God looked at the content of his heart and in the times he was out looking after the sheep, he was praying, he was worshipping, he was uh, spending time in God's presence, just worshipping God, loving God and getting to know who God was and who God says he is. Reading the scriptures. Um, and he grows up a little and he ends up battling Goliath, the giant, a uh, Philistine enemy, slaying him with a slingshot, a one shot to the head, uh, when no one else could kill the guy and, and everybody was scared of him and looked like the, the enemy was going to overrun Israel and he saves Israel from this invading army and he's rewarded by King Saul for his bravery and skill. He becomes the royal harpist to soothe the king's angry moods. He, he finds his best friend in the king's son, Jonathan, and he, he ends up marrying the king's daughter. The, the king tried to kill him and trick him into getting killed by the Philistines in order to marry his daughter, but David does what's asked of him and he kills a lot of the enemy and gets to marry the king's daughter. What a, what a love story. Um, he becomes a soldier and a leader of thousands. He's well loved by the people. And then the king Saul, becoming jealous of, of David's popularity um, and sees him as a threat, then says, right, I need to kill this guy. And uh, his best friend Jonathan saves his life and says, look, the king's out to kill you for sure. Uh, so David flees, he lives on the run and in exile while he's hunted by the king and his men. Uh, he lives in caves, he joins the enemy Philistine army uh, because that's the only option left to him. Uh, he writes the Psalms, he gathers a band of outlaws, turns them into David's mighty men, a, a fighting army of, of wonder that's unrenowned. And there's times where he could have killed the king uh, and doesn't. And I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, Eventually, King Saul dies in battle. David is crowned king, and David grows the borders of the country. He makes it very prosperous and powerful. He uh, becomes one of the greatest kings in, in all of Israel. Um, but he's not perfect. There's one time um, where he famously commits adultery, or in reality, he, he uses his position as king to take advantage of a married woman. And uh, he ends up having a husband killed when he realizes she's pregnant as a result of his actions and um, he's just made this horrible horrible immoral and unethical mistake um, and uh, he has to make that right and he repents of of, of what he's done uh, to God and and the people and um, he has to make it right and in those days making it right was actually widows didn't have any protection if they weren't married and he killed her husband so the only option left really was to marry her um, and offer the protection of him being a king and and and, and his wife and so he does that and um, a crazy world that it was back then and his that son that, that kid that was born as a result of that eventually becomes his heir and becomes the wisest and richest king in all the history of Israel and that was King King Solomon um, and eventually, Jesus himself was birthed via uh, 
David's descendants, uh, which is which is huge. It kind of shows if you look at the list of people who were descended uh, from David, uh, there were some crazy people in there and some really sinful people. Uh, but God obviously uh, looks beyond that and chose to use that line uh, of family to to bring His Savior into the world uh, through Mary. Um, anyway, what a story! Big story there. Uh, all the things David got up to. Uh, but the first part, the very first part I really appreciate is, is at the beginning of the story. And that's when God chooses David over his brothers because of the content of David's heart. And God says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the content of the man's heart. Chapter 16, verse 7. First Samuel 16, verse 7. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the contents of a man's heart. And what I take from that is that what you stirred in secret, what you do when you're alone, what you do when no one's looking, what you think and act about uh, when no one knows what's going on in your head, God notices. And always choosing to do the right thing by God will bring blessing and fruit. God's very clear about that in the Bible. He says, doing right will bring blessing and fruit uh, in your life. And it's the right thing to do. And sometimes in the midst of hardship and everybody's against what you're saying and what you're doing, doing the right thing is still important because it's the right thing. And choosing to do right in the moment of temptation is to be rewarded. And it really sets you up for success uh, as an individual and as a leader when harder challenges come down the line. And I think all of you are future leaders uh, and it's important to be able to set standards and uh, even more set up habits, I suppose, now. So in the future, when harder decisions are to be made and harder moments are to be made, you're able to do it. Uh, so saying yes to small temptations now when no one's looking will make it very easy in the future when you have a really big temptation and a lot of peer pressure to do a wrong thing, you're going to be able to say no to doing the wrong thing far easier because you've said yes to doing the right thing in all those small moments before. And spending time in God's presence builds relationship and understanding with him. That's what King David did. That's what made God choose him was the time he spent as a shepherd, reading the scripture in the fields, worshiping God, praying to God, understanding who God was and the content of God's heart. God recognized that and said, yeah, you know me. You know who I am and what I want in life. I choose you. So do that, be encouraged by that. The more we spend time in God's presence, the more we're going to understand who God is and what he wants. And it's far easier to live life knowing God than not knowing God and wondering what we should do next. Because obviously what God wants is the best for us and our families and our friends. Um, the next part of David's story that I really appreciate is the length of time that passes between when he's anointed to be king as a boy actually becoming king as a man we we don't often realize how long this is when you read it it's just a couple chapters later you know a few chapters down the line kills a giant comes you know goes on the run becomes king but in reality decades pass between the two points decades a, a lifetime really it's in those decades i imagine and i know really there were tons of moments when david doubted that he was going to be king someday it probably seemed a ridiculous childish dream. He's sitting in a cave in the pouring rain, being hunted by the king's men. People want him dead. And he's like, what am I dreaming? Was, did that really happen? Did, was I actually anointed by God's prophet as a boy? Uh, am, I, am I actually supposed to be king someday? Maybe, maybe I'm all being ridiculous here. You know, clearly God's favor is not on me in the moment. But, you know, that's all eyes from the enemy. God did anoint him to be king and God's promise will stand even when the circumstances don't seem like it. Um, and he probably doubted it. I know he doubted it uh, at times, really. Um, he had to have. But when he was being hunted, when everybody wanted to kill him, when the king seemed all powerful, and David ended up having to go to the enemy Philistines and fight for them because there was no other option, and there seemed to be no light at the end of the tunnel, it must have seemed crazy to trust God that he would be king, let alone that he would survive with his life. Um, and we can see how he felt and how depressed he was at times with the lyrics of his psalms. And he spent time in caves and wrote chapters and chapters and chapters of the psalms. And he pours out his heart and his thoughts in his poetry and in his lyrics and in the words of the psalms. 
And yet, throughout all that, you can also see how much he held on to God's friendship and the promises uh, in the midst of that. The time he spent in the field as a boy wasn't worthless. The time he spent out there, he, God, he still remembered as an adult and said, no, God's my friend. God knows what I want and God's promises are true and I'll hold on to it even though my circumstances don't seem like it. And this is something I want you guys uh, to hold on to and to remember constantly. God's promises come in his time, not ours. God's promises are true. God's promises are good. But they come in his time, not ours. You may have a God-given dream or vision. You may have a God-given purpose for your life. You may know that already. You may not. Maybe you're still waiting to find out. But I don't want you to be put off by today's circumstances which make that dream or vision or purpose seem like a pie-in-the-sky crazy idea. I don't want you to be put off when other people say, nah, that's ridiculous. You're, that's too big a dream. No. Nah. Um, I want you to be, pre be prepared. Wait decades, if you have to, for God's promises to come through you might have to wait a long time you might have to wait as long as king david you might have to wait as long as noah god made him a promise that the world was going to flood and to build a boat and it took hundreds of years to build the boat before the flood came you know there must have been times where he thought this is ridiculous so i want you to be prepared to wait decades for god's promises to come true but trust god's promises always come true always and you can trust in him because they always come true. Use every challenge in the meantime to build up a habit of trust and faith in God. Uh, the Psalms are some of the most valued parts of the Bible. They were written in King David's darkest days. And what you end up creating and saying and doing in your darkest days may end up being a shining beacon of hope and comfort to the others in the future. Never underestimate the bigger picture of today's challenges and hardships. No matter how painful or tough the moment may be right now, what comes out of that, the fruit of that, may have an amazing positive effect for those in the future. So I want you to hold on to who God is and trust in him and understand no matter how hard the circumstances, God's promises always come true and be prepared to wait for them if need be. Um, yeah. Favourite part of the story uh, is actually when King David's hiding in a cave from King Saul and his huntsmen. King Saul enters the cave to relieve his bladder and uh, David's hiding right there, going, oh, don't pee on me. Um, but he's hiding a secret, God doesn't see him. Oh no, no, sorry, King Saul doesn't see him. And uh, his, David's mates are like, you know, motioning to him, kill him now, we would be done of him, done of this running and hiding. Um, but King David says, no, that's, it's not the right thing to do. This is. This man is the king, and God appointed him to be king. And yeah, I'm, I'm to be king one day, but it's not my place to fast track that and push that. Uh, this man is still king, and that position demands respect. Uh, no, he doesn't do nothing. Uh, king David sneaks up, cuts a bit off his tunic, uh, and so when the king's finished uh, peeing, he walks out, and David comes out of the hiding and says, you, Samuel, I could have killed you there, but I didn't. Here's a bit of your tunic. And, uh, you know, leave me alone, basically. And, hey, uh, you know, um, I could have killed you there, but I didn't. Uh, just as a sort of warning to, uh, to Saul. Um, and David knew it wasn't his place to rush God's plan for him. Uh, and he honoured the position King Saul had as God's appointed king, even though he was promised that position next. Uh, it's a reminder to us to respect those in positions of power and authority, even if we disagree with their actions, and even if they seem to be nasty, immoral people. You can disagree without having to be nasty or violent in return. And it's important, especially in today's social media-infused world, uh, where you know the word the world is saying one thing and God is saying another. Uh, you know, think uh, President Trump in America. My wife's American and she says, look, I may not agree with everything he says. Uh, I may not like all of his decisions, but he's still my president. I still have to honor his position. Um, you know, think of identity politics and things like that, where the world's saying one thing and God's saying a very different thing. Uh, 
it's important to act honorably in our words and deeds, even in the midst of disagreement, persecution and hardship. Uh, David himself wrote in Psalm 37, 35, consider the blameless, observe the upright, and a future awaits those who seek peace. So look, to summarize, uh, these are the three points I want you to take away from this. One, God looks at the heart, not the, not the outward appearance. That's chapter 16, verse 7 of 1 Samuel. God takes time uh, to bring his promises about, about sometimes. Uh, so stir that time well. Don't let disappointments or setbacks dictate your future. Be aware that your greatest moments may come from within your darkest setbacks. And three, honour those positions uh, in positions of authority, even if they seem crazy or stupid in their speech and actions. At the end of the day, God says he will raise those he wants to raise and he will cause others to fall in his timing. And it's not for us to rush God's timing or force his favour even when it involves our own lives. Uh, so do what's right, work hard, even in the midst of hardship and when things don't seem to go in uh, the right way and trust that God's promises will come through. All right, bless you guys.